It's always the way that a lot of speakers can't stay till the end of the conference, but we're fortunate enough to have a group who have, so thank you very much. Um, I'm going to read out the questions. There aren't a great deal, and then we'll take questions from the floor. So these are the questions that have been placed in the box. The first one is, is there any idea of the age of the oldest person with PWS? We're aware of a man in his 50s and several in their 40s. I can say in Australia, as far as I know, the oldest person is turning 59 this year. There was a man who was supposedly 70 in Tassie, but I think he has since died. Janice, what about America? 70. 70. Thank you. Any takers on 70? No. Okay. Should I have the microphones? Okay. Okay, next question. This is for Dr. Foster. Um, in your presentation about the train, you mentioned that it's better to in not to involve people with PWS they have children here with PWS, in food preparation. My nine-year-old daughter loves partaking in food preparation. Um, what advice could you give me on uh, to keep her from doing this, or for, to keep this from becoming a problem in the future? Um, it's a good idea for Peter, people with PWS, something, the food, professionally. Right, Thank you. Right there, oh, is that yours? Right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll just read the last bit. Is it a good idea for PWS people to uh, pursue a, 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 a career in the food industry? Okay. Um, is this on? Yeah, yeah, it is. Okay. So um, when I did the, the train lecture, the food security lecture, I did make that recommendation that we would not suggest that people be involved in food preparation because that might increase anxiety. Um, but I also said that each person is different and each person has to be assessed at, at their level, baseline level, and also what that experience does for them. Um, I think that it, it does increase anxiety if they're involved around food, um, but each person is different. So I think each person has to be assessed for what works for them. Thank you. Next question. In New Zealand, once growth hormone is approved, there are no follow-up sleep studies um, if no initial problems are found. How do we know tonsils or adenoids tissue hasn't grown to cause a problem? Is there always snoring or visibly enlarged tonsils? Should we be pushing for more screening? I can only just speak for what we do in Melbourne and um, we always do follow-up um, sleep studies but then the, in the follow-up which is every three months with the endocrinologist there's a very clear history taken so that if there is a suspicion of um, concern about s um, sleep obstruction that there are repeat studies and I'm not quite sure if, if um, Gillian actually um, presented her, her figures but there are a number of people and a number of our patients who have had to take off um, growth hormone um, and wait until their sleep um, recalibrates re itself and gets back to normal. Usually if there's large um, tonsillar tissue that's very easily seen by either the general practitioner or, or the paediatrician or whoever's looking down the throat with a spatula and a torch. The adenoid tissue is hard to see and really need the ENT surgeon's um, special mirror to see that um, but usually um, with the upper airways obstruction from adenoid tissue you'll get a history um, it's difficult though you don't always get a history when you have the um, diminished sleep at night or the apneas and that, that's the tricky one so if there's any concerns that we do do a further sleep study I don't know if that answers the question Yes, yes, yes. The the upper airway you usually do get a symptom. It's with the other sleep sleep disorders that you don't get the symptom, and that's where the concern are concerns are. But um, certainly, 
um, with there's been a number of children who have taken off. Probably won't happen. No. It's unusual to the annual tissue goes up to the first six six weeks, two months. It, it doesn't if it is going to increase. But um, certainly, her work has shown that the other the other um, sleep disorders you don't always get symptoms. So it's a very careful history and observation. Great, and also I think changing the behaviour of the child or person if they're a lot sleepier, you might then start to investigate it, or if changing weight as well. Okay, given that the work of Jennifer Miller at the University of Florida has shown that a uh, calorie restricted lower carbohydrate diet improves body composition um, over calorie restriction alone, why are many dietitians reluctant to break away from the traditional high carb, low fat diet for PWS? Does high carb, low calorie uh, rice crackers, etc., cause problems with sustained energy and insulin spikes? Why don't we focus more on the type of food, not just the calories? It's the work of Jennifer Miller, and actually her work talks about, um, has shown that a calorie restricted low carb diet, but the carbs are the high caloric carbs, more so than the other. I think, I think there's a lot of confusion about um, calorie restriction. A lot of people, um, I mean, basically a calorie is a calorie, whether it comes from carbohydrate, mm. whether it comes from protein, whether it comes from fat. Now, in someone who doesn't have Prader-Willi syndrome, we know that a higher fat, higher protein intake will actually increase satiety. But we're not sure, we're not sure that that is actually going to happen in someone with um, Prader-Willi syndrome. I mean, when already we've seen research that indicates that satiety is very different, but they don't have satiety like normal healthy matched individuals will have. So I think what tends to happen when people cut down on their carbohydrate intake, they're also cutting down on their calorie intake. It's actually very difficult exactly. to eat a low carbohydrate diet in our current society. Most snack foods that we eat are high carbohydrate. And often that carbohydrate keeps company with fat too. So it's very difficult just to eat, for example, high sugar foods without the fat. I mean, case in point is look at afternoon tea. Right? Most people would say those cakes were high carb, but they actually were high fat too. So I think we've got to be a bit careful how we look at food in terms of breaking it down into good and bad and, and using sort of the different macronutrient or protein, fat, carbohydrate content. The most important thing is to make sure we look at getting nutrient-dense foods. Now, that, if that means eating foods that are high in protein that also have other valuable vitamins like iron and zinc, etc., then that's a really good thing because at the end of the day, with Prader-Willi syndrome, they do have such a restricted energy needs that we need to make sure that every mouthful packs a punch in terms of nutrients. So if that means cutting down the carbs like you know, white flour and things that are made with lots of sugar, then that's, that's obviously sensible, isn't it? But um, I think just to wipe out carbs and say that they're bad, just for the sake of that, there's also some very nourishing carbs, some very high fibre carbs that we need to include in our diet um, if we've got the, uh, you know, with our energy allowance um, allow, if our energy needs rather allow that. The important thing is to individualise the diet to suit the person and, um, and that's where you know, a dietitian can, can certainly help in that situation. I don't think there's necessarily a trend for dietitians to push carbs, not at all, but yeah. I think it's getting the balance right and, what, and, and making sure that the diet is nutrient dense, particularly with such low calorie um, requirements with someone with PWS. Thank you, okay. Did you want to comment on that? Okay. I think also it's it's helpful that in Jennifer's paper she's put down you know thirty percent fat, whatever percent um, carbohydrate, and it's because it's written there it doesn't mean I've got to put fat back in the diet. We do get a lot of fat from the food we eat anyway, and she was just calculating the macronutrients of the foods. Okay. Okay. The next one. Our daughter is. Sorry. Um, I'm trying to think who it was. It might have been Karen um, in the previous session that was talking about uh, insulin response to carbohydrate. Um, I've become aware of some work that talks about you know, adverse effects of overproduction of insulin, you know, swelling and, and fat production and that sort of stuff. So if 
if you take that into consideration, then an understanding that you know, carbohydrates are everywhere and we can't, we actually can't eliminate them completely from our, or not many people can eliminate them completely from our diets. What would your recommendation be uh, based on this this emerging evidence that, that there might be some other um, negative consequences of eating a high-carbohydrate car high diet, whether it be low or high GI? Again, if we look at what the big picture is in terms of getting the energy content of the diet right, right, we've got to make sure that we make sure that those foods that we include in that low energy diet are going to be really rich in nutrients, okay? So the first things you're going to look at are the protein foods. Um, and then you're going to look at things that are like some nourishing high fiber carbohydrate. Now, by the time you get through eating the high protein foods, there's actually not a lot of um, calories left. And what we tend to do is encourage bulky, low calorie, high fiber foods like vegetables and salads. So that helps to create the bulk and, and, and make a meal look more substantial without the calories. And there's lots of creative things that I've heard parents talking about during this whole conference, like making spaghetti, for example, out of zucchini. Um, and you know, zucchetti, zuc 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 as it's now called. Um, and just to take your point about if you want to go down the really low carbohydrate um, you know, pathway, I mean, there's lots of people out there doing it. You only have to you know, read Pete Evans' websites and get involved in that sort of following. That, that's pretty, that's pretty extreme, actually. I, I tend to say to, to all my patients, look, anything extreme, whether it be diet or religion, is actually dangerous. It's actually unhealthy. There is some good research behind the dietary guidelines that we use here in Australia and New Zealand. And I think that, um, you know, the evidence is there for, you know, eating a balance. It doesn't mean eliminating major food groups. But obviously with something, you know, that is so energy restricted as a part of really syndrome diet, you need to get the core foods in there first. And that probably means sacrificing a few carbs along the way, but not eliminating them. Thank you. Okay, in schools, another food one. In schools now, um, there's a garden food program and it's, is it a positive or a negative experience for our kids with PWS to be part of this? The food's grown, harvested, prepared and eaten as a class. Um, <coughs> um, I like that idea. Um, because a lot of our guys do like horticultural activities. It provides a lot of sensory stimulation and I think it's a good educational experience. Um, most of those tend to be um, uh, low carbohydrate. Um, so I, I don't see a, a problem with that. I think it's a really good experience and it also is something that people can do together. Um, I always um, advocate for our guys to have a garden if they can do it uh, because they really enjoy it. Okay, this one's for David Siegel, and I'll just m read it out, but I would suggest that um, whoever has written it, um, contact him by email, or one of our other geneticists, and unfortunately, I think they've all gone. Um, what is the time frame for gene therapy to be brought to PWS patients? Patients with PWS, please. Um, acids from the HIV example, give a, given on Saturday, um, are there any other examples um, and are, are, they, are they able to switch on and off genes and how effective have these been in achieving them? The other examples. Are you there? I can't say much, but I was at um, the uh, forum on, on Friday where David was talking about that and um, the HIV thing is in mice so far and well, my, the mouse model from what my understanding and it, it and that technology will be for blood, so it'll be very different. And he gave a span of 10 to 20 years, and that was being optimistic. 10 but to 20 years, okay. People, but certainly, um, you know, that's not in concrete. Thank you. So we still have to work on management. Thank you. Our daughter is eight years of age. She is nonverbal and needs to wear pull-ups. As she has developed pubic hair and breast buds, she has elevated levels of testosterone and we've been told periods may start. My question is, if she were to start having her periods, what happens with her growth hormone injections? We are at a loss and feel completely alone without answers. We live in Queensland. Um, 
I don't fully understand um, the clinical situation. It's not uncommon for, for, for girls to get, and, and for boys to get um, uh, their hirsute or their hair changes, which come from the adrenal glands rather than from the gonadal tissue. But um, having a high testosterone without having the other hormones, female hormones measured, I can't really make much, can't comment on that. And probably just because she's developing pubic hair and breast buds doesn't mean she's going to start menstruating. No, no, no. I mean, um, as I said, and we call that andronarchy when you, you sometimes might get a very, very small bud um, but not then go on to the full breast development, but you'll have, you might get hair. And that's not, not uncommon. Um, I understand you're in Queensland. I would be contacting, um, asking the paediatrician or the um, endocrinologist for a bit more advice. Certainly in Victoria now and other states, we have nurse-led clinics that can talk about the adolescent type issues that occur in um, for teenagers in disability, and that might be something. But um, it probably needs a bit more look looking at. can get um, a precocious puberty, but this is a little girl. I'd need to know her other hormones. Okay, okay um, two on bowels and guts. So, um, gastric motility problems. Is there a treatment and what should we be aware of? Gastric motility problems. Is there a treatment and what should be aware of? We be aware of. And also, we have major debilitating bowel issues other than a life time of high dose mov movicol fluids and fibre, what can we do? It's a major quality of life issue for our dear boy. Gastric motility and um, So this family did um, talk to me and I recommended that they um, go to our website. My colleague is a developmental pediatrician and one of her expertise uh, areas is, is managing chronic constipation. Uh, unfortunately, once you get into a constipation uh, mode, what happens is that your bowel really dilatates and you get what's called a functional megacolon, which requires really um, a clean out. And what that means is a, uh, to, get, to get the fecal material out of the colon and then a fairly vigorous um, intervention of laxatives that, that keep it um, free of accumulating for months. This is not something that just happens as an acute treatment. This is something that has to occur over time. But our, my concern in this particular case is that uh, in, in all children with prader syndrome is that that uh, tendency toward constipation really is a marker for decreased gastric motility that is all through the GI tract. So that I think that that hypotonia is expressed all through the GI tract as well. And so I think that if you have a tendency toward uh, constipation, then it also has a tendency to decrease gastric motility. And that probably is even more of an acute uh, medical concern or medical risk for our individuals. I want to mention that, um, again, in our phenomenological study, that is actually interviewing parents of young children, because when we first learned about the gastroparesis, we thought it was only, as it was published in the, in the literature, only occurring in adults and only occurring after binges. And we know now that that is absolutely not true, that we see it frequently in the developmental period, and that once a child has an episode, they're more likely to have episodes. The parents become really good at identifying this because the child actually won't want to eat. Um, they'll have sort of vague abdominal complaints, but the real key is that the child has abdominal distension. Um, in those children who are at risk, we advocate actually measuring abdominal circumference uh, and get repeated measures so that we, when you present to the emergency room, you have data to show the doctors that there is a problem. Uh, because the treatment of choice for gastroparesis is that you drop a tube through the nose uh, down into the stomach to decompress, um, or you just keep the person nothing by mouth. And most parents who successfully manage this at home um, actually do that. They just don't feed their child for a period of time, and the episode resolves. 
I hope that's helpful. Hi, um, I was the family that spoke to you earlier about this, um, but I didn't actually pop that question in, so obviously someone else out there is suffering the same as us. Um, I just wanted to ask basically about the levels of um, Mubicol and Duplax that my son is on. I think my greatest concern is that he's on a regular dose and his body is actually becoming quite used to it. Um, and what I find is after sort of two, three months of being on it, um, it's not doing what it's supposed to do anymore. And I have to try to juggle and decide whether or not to increase the dose myself or everything I do with his diet doesn't seem to really make a difference. We've done lots of different things as far as exercise goes, increasing swimming, increasing exercise on the ball and trying to strengthen his core. Um, we've done sitting after every meal for 10 to 15 minutes on the toilet. I even had his school taking him after every first lunch, second lunch, sitting with him. Um, feet's on stools, blowing into windmills to create that motion. We've done everything and um, he still seems to be, every few weeks, it'll clear and then all of a sudden it just builds up again. Um, there's just a real lack of muscle um, in his stomach that's just not passing things through properly. He's had x-rays done, there's no blockage. He is known for eating non-food items um, and obviously not having me with him as much as I once was. Now that he's at school, I was concerned that he might have consumed a stone or uh, he's eaten pips before from inside fruit. Um, but all that seems to be clear. So just really at a bit of a loss of, he has been cleaned out once, um, but it wasn't completely cleaned out. Um, they did one flush and then that was it and then sent him home with a lot of laxatives. So just a little bit concerned that the laxatives are just going to increase in volume and eventually he's just going to be immune to them. What's the reaction? Uh, yeah, um, I did a little bit of reading into um, TENS machines. Um, so <sighs> there was a theory that if you used a TENS machine on somebody with a weak bowel, that it could increase the muscles and strengthen the muscles in the stomach and in the bowel. I was curious on whether or not there would be any benefit to actually using the TENS machine when he's on the toilet. So just to kick start. But I think rather than really my, my, my suggestion or my, my question was, is, um, had the family worked with a, a pediatric uh, physiotherapist who was specialist in continence and in bowel continence? That, that <coughs> might be an avenue that you could pursue. Are you in Victoria? Yes. I'll yep. talk to me. Great. Okay, a question for Anne Sakaris. Um, is there parental information available to use for the education of teachers and carers? Number one, there's a second part of it. <laughs> uh, managing independence and money. How is the guardianship decision rationalised with David? Okay, um, the first one, there's some good information on the international website um, that can be useful for um, resources for for teachers, for, for others. Um, there may even be some on the Australian website, some links to that. Um, don't be afraid to develop your own um, if you're needing to, to work with, with people with training. Um, draw from what's available on the internet, um, but more particularly if you have access to people that can, can come and speak and address um, in training. Um, there is a best practice book that was uh, developed through the International Caregivers uh, Association through IPSO, and this book has, um, um, that Georgina has access to, um, it has a chapter on uh, everything that the teacher needs to know about prader willi syndrome, which I have found extremely helpful uh, going to a school and saying these are consensus guidelines for teachers working with individuals with prader willi syndrome and I Xerox the cover of the book and I, I take it uh, with me 
And there are also uh, a lot of very helpful uh, chapters on behavioral management, food, food management in a variety of settings. And I have found that to be a very helpful tool uh, for training. Thank you. Also, just on the US website, there, there are two very quite short articles, but they're fabulous on how do people with PWS think and tips for dealing with people with, or managing people with PWS. They're simple and they're really great for teachers and for caregivers. Uh, my nephew is four and gorgeous. He, sorry. Yes, yep. Yeah, that's fine. Um, with regard to... Um, yeah, um, do you want me to just... Say, yeah, yeah. Be yeah, it might be better. Look, just on the issue of the financial stuff, um, um, the issue with guardianship was complex um, and um, in our situation um, uh, David actually chose to chop Anne out of that process um, but let me in. So, um, And when it came to the table we ended up in a guardianship room with the senior people on the board and David was there and I was there. Um, the departmental people were there, his support staff were there. Um, and they actually asked David significant questions um, pertaining to what he actually wanted to do. Um, and they asked him about his money and, they, and, and in a way they, they phrased it to him this way. They said, look, there are probably two options with your money that we recommend. One is that um, the public guardian can control your finances or because your father is currently controlling your finances, would you like that to continue? Um, when it was put to David like that, he opted to have me continue. He wanted to do that. Um, but I, I guess just to stress in that whole situation, um, which has you know, proved effective for us, that there are actually civil liberties issues involved in the guardianship process. And, and my guess is if David had jumped up and down and said, no way, I don't want that da di da di da um, I want my own money, um, whether we would have got it up or not, I don't know, to be honest. But um, one of the good things about the process with Dave was that he was involved with it and I think he made a choice for his own health benefit um, to cooperate with what was being proposed to him and obviously the results of that have come out over the last five or six years and it's been good to see but um, I, I guess um, my gut feeling about that process is if the PWS person doesn't want to be part of it, it's um, it's pretty well fraught with, um, with difficulty, I think, on that basis. I hope that answers that question. Thank you. My nephew is four and gorgeous. He has already gained weight. How easy is it to shift or lose that weight? <laughs> all our babies are absolutely gorgeous. They are the most beautiful of all the babies. Um, not that your nephew isn't super special. Um, you know, I think a, a, a weight regulation really requires calorie control, um, exercise, which is a source of energy expenditure. Um, and so what we know is that, that calories in has to equal calories out or the net is gonna be weight gain. Um, so I don't know whether he is on growth hormone, that will certainly help. Um, but I think uh, exercise is always a very important place to start. But, but he, we often um, in paediatrics say we don't like a child to lose weight but just to maintain their weight. So if the child can just maintain that weight and get down to the, the right centile, that would be good. And it can be done. Um, we see that, especially um, when children go overseas for holidays or have changes in their life and they come back overweight or a bit more, um, the next visit they're, they're back on track. So it's possible, but everyone has to be involved, everyone who cares for the child, um, all family members and all daycare members. Well, well um, Mia's never been overweight, so... Um, because we've maintained a, a vigilant um, concentration on her weight. So she, she is weighed, but she weighs herself, and she will tell me when her weight goes up. Um, <laughs> I look over her shoulder, <laughs> just check. Um, but I can actually see it, I'm very, I'm very aware. And I can also see it in her brace and how open or closed that is. 
Um, but what I notice is if weight goes up, the best thing is to bring it down very uh, uh, straight away. So, th and that's, that's how you maintain a, a level uh, playing field. But I think um, you'd have to create a, a, a change in um, exercise, a change in program. Uh, and I, at a f when we're talking about a four-year-old, I think it's really important that it's not exercise that you are doing, but it is a program of things that are fun. Um, like, for instance, we do paper planes off the balcony, and that means stairs up and down, uh, past ponds and around things where the plane goes to. And if, if, uh, if the, uh, a twin throws the plane, that means the plane's going a long way. So there's a lot of walking and a lot of up and downs. And so I think you've got to just, and Mia does ballet, so I think you've got to just keep exercise in the equation, really. Yeah, thank you. Who do I speak to about getting support for after school care run at my daughter's school by Camp Australia? Thank you. Okay, I would um, start by approaching Camp Australia directly. As I said, they will contact their Noah's Ark who will put into place a funding system for your child. If you have any difficulties dealing with um, Camp Australia, I would go to the principal of the school and just say, this is the situation and I would hope that then a system would be put into place. But Camp Australia, they're terrific. We have Camp Australia at our school at the moment and they're very, very proactive if you need any support. Thank you. And the last one. Could you briefly explain confabulation and the problems and risks this can cause for service providers, professionals who work with the client with PWS? <laughs> okay. Um, collab um, confabulation. Um, I like to call it storytelling uh, because I think that people confuse it with a, a problem that occurs in aging people like me um, who, <laughs> who can't quite uh, remember what they're supposed to be saying and so they use fillers to sort of tell a story. Um, people who confabulate frequently um, will not have the same consistent story and that's very different from what happens in Prader-Willi syndrome. Our guys can be very creative um, in the stories that they tell. Um, sometimes those stories are absolutely repeatable in the context in which it is occurring. So I have to tell you my personal experience with individuals who s tell stories. Um, it is most damaging when it has to do with some type of an abusive event. I had a young lady who was very consistent in her report of a sexualized uh, event that occurred uh, with a family member, um, and she told me this story repeatedly over multiple days, and it was always the same, always the same data, always presented consistently. That is usually an indication that this is a veritable report, and so I did report it. Um, she did go on to have a further evaluation uh, by psychology, um, and the most amazing thing was she told the psychologist a totally different story. Um, and this is typical of what you can see. Um, and it can be very dam damaging, and it can end careers. Um, so it, is, it can be a significant problem. Um, if you imagine that the reward of telling a whopper um, is that you get a lot of attention for that, there's a lot of... Um, uh, activity around telling the story that perpetuates the behavior, um, and that's really a problem. So I think that if you have an individual who has this propensity, um, I think that it's really helpful to be proactive and come up with a specific plan for how it will be dealt with. Um, I think in those individuals who might make up stories about sexual abuse, um, I think it's very important for the staff uh, to make sure that there are multiple staff on shift and that the person is never left alone with someone because of this uh, problem, uh, which does add to c cost and, and also um, uh, decrease in privacy, but that's a necessity. Um, so there are a lot of theories about why individuals with Prader-Willi syndrome do this type of storytelling. Um, some people think of this as a developmental phenomenon, 
um, that it is part of what all of us go through in our language acquisition. It's just that individuals with PWS have this tendency and it tends to linger even into adulthood. Um, so that's one possibility. Um, the second is um, that they take bits and pieces of information that they have seen in the world, either by report of other people or by watching something on TV or seeing it in a movie, and then they incorporate that into their own personal experience and they can come up with some really incredible whoppers. Um, it, it is, uh, and then there's another kind that is uh, sort of addressing the, the language, receptive language problems and this working memory difficulty. So um, they can be listening to conversation that is going on between two people, but they only hear parts of it. And then what they do is they sort of connect the dots in a way that really it doesn't make any, it's not, it's not veritable. Um, and that also uh, is another form of uh, storytelling. So there, there are a variety of reasons for why people do this. And can I just say, FAMCARE have a very nice article on storytelling. And just to remember that some, some people with PWS, confabulation is making up stories that you honestly believe. And some people with PWS believe them so wholeheartedly. I had one girl in my room who we realised it was a story. And she said to me, am I going mad? I really thought this was true. And it was really sad because we had to talk all about that then. But anyway, confabulation is a real thing. Storytelling. Uh, I'd, I'd just like to uh, just put a warning in here. Just watch with the um, communication. If you give too much information to a child, they may grasp, a, a, a child with pride ability, they may grasp only one bit of that information um, and then use that information back and forth to the teacher, then the te te a small amount of information from the teacher to the parent and back and forth until the uh, story has become quite uh, aggressive and, and difficult. We had this go over a two year period to the point that my daughter then pretended that she was unable to read, went for assessment and did oh, her IQ drop down from 88 to 48 within that period of time in assessment. Um, so she, she built that story quite largely until it came to the point that I brought her into a principal and uh, like I had to convince her that she could actually, uh, that it was a good idea that she sh showed the truth. And uh, eventually I took her into the principal's office uh, without pictures and she showed that she could actually read at a level much higher than anybody had ever expected. So. It's the use of small amounts of information, especially when there's a volatile situation in a school or with authorities of some sort. Just be aware of that. Thanks, Jo. Just along those lines, um, uh, an experience with my son recently or when before school ended, um, one incident of him throwing another student's jacket uh, over the fence of the school into uh, the surrounding houses landed in the backyard and um, he I told my husband about this when I got the information from the teacher he uh, picked up Cooper from school one day on the drive home David said oh I've spoken to Cooper it wasn't him that did it after all it was uh, the boy threw it over himself and I said all oh, right okay so I said did you know how did you find that out what did he say and and he sort of briefly explained how he questioned Cooper about it. Uh, but then, of course, I sat down with him and asked different questions <laughs> and finally came to the conclusion and Cooper admitted that, no, it wasn't a jumper, which is the wording that his father used. It was a jacket. And, uh, and yes, he did thro actually throw it over. So in that way, uh, he's sort of manipulating the truth as well. And... Uh, it's, it makes it really difficult to um, get the right questions in the right order without uh, making suggestions of what you want to hear as well. And so pulling those little threads and stitching them back together to get the right information uh, and get the whole story is uh, really tricky. So your story reminds me of what we caution all families who have children with Prader-Willi syndrome is 
um, to really be, be there and be present, and we do this with adults too. Um, be present at the time of medical evaluations mm -hmm. because when they size up the situation and they feel that they should be saying yes to something because that's what they think is expected of them, um, they will endorse every single review of systems in any kind of a medical evaluation. And we had one geneticist who told a family who then subsequently told us, he said, whatever you do, keep them away from doctors. <laughs> Thank you all very much. It's been great. And you've asked some very interesting and excellent questions. So I'm going to now call on Karen O'Reilly, who's the CEO of um, PWSA New Zealand, to, to close. Last person to get up here. No PowerPoints, no um, chromosome slides. Uh, just before we close, um, putting together a conference like this is a huge amount of work, um, and we've had a committee do that. But um, the most work is the person in the hosting city. And for this conference, that has been the wonderful Tess Maguire. Come up here, Tess. Tessa's, uh, but Tessa and all her family who've been roped in this weekend also um, will be very pleased when the conference is over because she has done a fantastic job, as I'm sure you'll all agree, um, at great personal cost, I'm also sure. Um, so Tessa, a little something from us to say thank you. Well, it's been an intensive two days. Um, with more facts and figures bandied around than my mind can keep up with. I'm looking forward to revisiting some of these talks online. Um, they have been recorded, and we will email you all to let you know when um, these are available so that you can also revisit them. But here, for a quick recap, are some of the things we've learnt this weekend. We've learnt that there is a huge amount of research happening around the world, with some extremely talented doctors and professionals committing significant amounts of their time and careers to understanding more about Prader-Willi syndrome and looking for treatments to alleviate the symptoms of PWS. Thank you to the many professionals that have attended and have spoken at this conference. I know we as parents are heartened to know that you're on our team. So very grateful for your dedication and your expertise and together we're all pulling for you to continue toward that crucial breakthrough in understanding and treating this complex syndrome. We've been reminded that there's an army of professional caregivers who daily spend time with our people with PWS, encouraging, cajoling and enticing them to do that which is healthiest for them and caring for them as people. We recognise the extraordinary effort that you make, your integrity, your care, your high level understanding and your dedication to people with this syndrome. And we are so grateful for all that you do. We've learned that the more we learn about Prader-Willi syndrome, the less we know. The intricacies of the human brain and our DNA are largely still secret to us and we're challenged with a complex set of problems. We've learned that the NDN mouse eats too much and has stunted whiskers. But not to worry, he will soon be replaced by the Prada pig. <laughs> Thank you to mice everywhere that have given your lives for PW. <laughs> we do recommend that all the pigs steer clear of Professor Siegel. <laughs> we learned from Scott Stifle this morning that we need to aim for optimised frustration. I have some days in my house where I'm totally there. <laughs> We've learnt about VTA, NAC, DRDZ, BDNF, IGF1, SORNAs, GHSRIs and more acronyms than you could shake a STICK at. <laughs> and we've learnt that we're all now qualified train drivers. We've learnt that there is such a thing as intermittent explosive disorder. I remain unclear as to whether this is a condition that people with PWS have or a state that they drive their parents to. And we've learnt about mesolimbics, amygdala, insula, and nucleus accumbens. I now know where the writers of Star Wars movies came up with all the planet names. <laughs> There's no doubt that PWS is an interesting scientific puzzle to, to solve, but it's more than that.
There's an old Maori proverb. Has that worked, Warren? I'm going to go full screen. There's an old Maori proverb that asks, what is the most important thing? The answer, hei tangata, hei tangata, hei tangata. The people, the people, the people. Beyond the eight proposed phenotypes, we have hundreds of different children and adults. And though they all share a wonky 15th chromosome, they have many differences that make them uniquely them. And we're all here because we love someone with PWS and we want the best for them. So we must always remember that we are first about the people and second about the science. It's about our children and adults with PWS, our PWS family, that club that you never wanted to be part of. And I think as parents we spend a lot of time worrying about our children with PWS and thinking about what they need. But in fact, it's you, the parent, that is the centre of the universe, not your child with PWS. To do this successfully for them, we as parents need to be healthy and engaged. Our relationships and marriages need to be strong. Our other siblings need to be in the mix. And we have to somehow balance all the competing demands that we have. Eleven years ago, when my son was just a new baby with PWS, we went to a young families gathering held by PWS New Zealand. And in that early storm of grief and anxiety, we met some other parents of new children. They seemed normal, well, relatively, and they still had a somewhat tenuous grip on reality. Um, they laughed and we had fun, and many of them are here today and have been here for this conference. Um, in fact, one of them, Gavin, whose daughter Margaret was then a tiny dot of a toddler with Shirley Temple curls, said to me after a discussion on the benefits of growth hormone that if his daughter was going to grow up to be a food-seeking missile, he wasn't at all sure he wanted her to be any bigger, stronger and faster. <laughs> that made me laugh then and has made me laugh many times since. Thanks, Gav. I think these friendships with other parents are precious. I feel blessed to have been at this conference with 30 other parents from New Zealand a very cool bunch of people, and amongst all the PWS learning, we've also had a great time and a lot of laughs. So these may not be the people that you'll socialise with each day, but they will be the people that truly understand your pain and frustration, your anxiety about the future, and those completely inappropriate Prada Willy jokes. And for each of us, along with the valuable take-home messages from our wonderful speakers, we will also all pocket gems from other parents, what they do at home, what works for them, what their kids are like, ideas to try and suggestions to think about. And these connections made here are so much more powerful than anything Facebook can ever provide. So I encourage you all to stay connected with each other, stay connected with your local association, get involved, there are exciting things coming and exciting things happening in Australia, in New Zealand and internationally. In the 1970s, the Hollies wrote a song, and the lyrics say, the road is long with many a winding turn that leads us to who knows where and who knows where. But I'm strong, strong enough to carry him. He ain't heavy, he's my son, my daughter. These may or may not be the actual lyrics. I think they got it partly right. As a bunch of parents, we are strong. I know we all worry about whether we can do it, but we're all here, you are doing it. We're doing it. We're living with what some studies show is one of the most stressful syndromes to manage. So to those that walk the road with me, I salute you. And to those that shine a light on the path ahead, I thank you. And to those that are finding the load just a little bit too heavy, know that you're not alone. I think Erin's presentation moved many of us to tears this morning. She demonstrated what we all want for our children, old and young. She is happy, she's busy, and she's thriving. And she stated in her slideshow, I am happy with who I am. And this surely is the very best we can give to any of our children, that they are content with their life and find fulfillment each day. 
So thank you for coming. Kakiteano, which means we will see you again. Safe travels home. Thank you.